Hello everyone, Matt here, and welcome back to another biographic. So, my dear viewers, I've promised to bring you both the best and the worst of the Game Boys library in my never-ending quest to collect and document every release of the Nintendo Game Boy. I've shown you some of the console's best titles, but there are two sides to every story. The Nintendo Game Boy is also a console notorious for the amount of licensed games on it. In fact, a few months ago I read on a blog by a guy called Chris McCovell, uh, links in the description, that out of the total 1,237 titles released across the Nintendo Game Boy library, both for the original DMG and the Game Boy Color, between the years 1989 and 2003, 375 of those games are licensed titles. Now, while I can't vouch for the math, as I don't have a complete Game Boy library yet, nor enough fingers to count that many licensed titles on, it is undoubtedly still a very high percentage of the Game Boy's library that is based on a popular license. Everything from Alien 3 to Yogi Bear got a look in, including some box office bombs such as Hudson Hawk, Waterworld and Cutthroat Island. But there is one movie, so bad it makes King of Fighters look like a must-see piece of cinema. And that film got a game the same level of quality as the big screen bomb itself. It's Cool World. For those of you who don't know, Cool World was a live action animated movie in a similar vein to Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which incidentally not only is a better film, but has much better games. The movie in a nutshell is essentially about a man called Jack, who, while in prison for murder, draws a comic book about a place called Cool World, starring a femme fatale nymphomaniac, uh, Wikipedia's words, not mine, called Hollywood. You get it? Whose actual animation in this game's opening sequence is perhaps the best thing about the game. Not because it's a pixely lady and probably the closest the Game Boy came to boobs, but it's actually animated properly in a game that is totally half-assed otherwise. Anyways, the plot of the film doesn't matter, because as with many licensed titles, this game has nothing to do with the source material. You play as Jack, who, like in the movie, has a pen that can ink out things. Your job is to simply ink all the bad guys by shooting them with your pen, then hoover them up Ghostbuster style before the player realises how shitty this game is. For starters, the game is pretty damn tough. Failing to suck your ink back up means a more powerful tune is released that are, well, a bitch to kill, as they avoid you like the plague and shoot projectiles most of the time. It doesn't really help that in this game's poor level design it is extremely easy to ink something off screen, and due to lack of depth in the visuals, fall down the screen away from the ink blob you just tried to suck up, meaning that you're gonna lose a lot of health to these suckers, and that sucks. Oh, it's a risk and reward kind of thing, as these enemies are tougher to kill, but they do occasionally offer health. The game never really decides what the player's motivation is either, as you're supposed to simply mop up all the enemies on screen. However, what the game never explains to you is that there are two screens in each wave, and to get there involves crouching in front of the very ominous black hole and pressing down an A. You know, that perfectly intuitive button combination. And the manual tells you to jump, so that's completely wrong too. Through these black holes, you'll then need to mop up more goons, which is as equally repetitive as the other screen. There are also items to collect that help you rack up points, uh, though these seem to bounce around between the two screens for no reason at all. And if they're on the other screen for too long, well, the screen starts to flash for no good reason, dragging a game over screen behind it not long after. This can also happen by running out of time, or getting killed by enemies, which is probably the most likely scenario. You blew it, boss. I wonder if that's a coda talking to the director of this terrible game, or that shitty excuse for a cartoon spider, cause yep, that's what it is, is referring to how low I sunk by purchasing this awful, awful game. The things I do for you lovely people. So, in short, the music's drab, the sprites look completely at odds with one another artistically. It's just a mess! And when you consider that this is a relatively obscure game, because, let's face it, no kid would have wanted it, not to mention that it was only released in the US and Spain, uh, means it's actually towards the higher end of the Game Boy's price spectrum. So with a total of 8 waves then a compulsory end game boss, it's short, bland, and in comparison to the Super Nintendo version of Cool World, just not worth your time. And that's not saying that the SNES game is great, but it's just this title would make E.T. look like Super Mario in comparison. Pick it up if you want, otherwise consider this video enough to quench your curiosity. 
both for the sake of your wallet and your love of video games. And that's it for this episode of Biographic, ladies and gentlemen. If you've liked it, click the subscribe button. Hey, if this is your first time viewing the channel, welcome. Check out some of our other videos. You can also look at videos for Boy Curious, which is a series in which I look at the bootlegs and curiosities of the Game Boy. Or you can check out Let's Play Together, where we're currently playing Pokemon. You decide what I do. Ooh. Till next time, guys. Game on.